Hello students, welcome to lecture 23 of the online course on nanophotonics, plasmonics and metamaterials. Today's lecture will be on effective medium theories. Now, if you remember um, the discussion on electrotunable optical devices where we discussed nanoparticles in aqueous medium or any other uh, kind of uh, uh, mixtures kind of cases where nanoparticles or any other dielectric uh, nanoparticles which are scattered in a homogeneous medium. In those cases, there is a requirement of estimating the effective permittivity of those medium. So, this is where this kind of theories will be very, very much applicable. So, today we will quickly look into certain things like uh, different classifications of engineered materials and here we will particularly focus on the mixtures and how do we uh, characterize those mixtures in terms of their uh, effective permittivity. And we will look into this effective medium theories, we will introduce this concept, then we talk about Wehner bounds, we will discuss about Maxwell Gunn theory, Bragman's theory and also Nicholson Ross Ware or NRW method. So, I believe you um, know this particular uh, slide now. So, these are the different classifications of the engineered materials. So, in this lecture, we will be mainly focusing on mixtures. So, mixtures are basically they are made of ordinary materials which are combined together to get some averaged property. So, that is very important here. So, we are looking for some averaged property in this case. Okay. So, what are the mixing rules for these uh, mixtures or engineered materials? Now, if you wish to mix multiple uh, materials together to get some overall material property, there has to be some kind of guidance through which we should achieve that, like some kind of formula that relates the effective permittivity to the permittivity of the constituent materials and that will be seen here. So, the effective dielectric constant of the mixture can be taken as epsilon effective and that depends on couple of things. Okay? So, something like uh, the shape of the materials, then the size of the particles, uh, electromagnetic properties of the particles, statistics of the particle distribution and the volume fraction of the constituent materials. So, how much volume one particular material is uh, covering that also plays a very important role. Okay. So, effective medium theories as I mentioned why they are needed. So, effective medium theories can provide a macroscopic model of inhomogeneous media based on analytical, numerical and sometimes experimental techniques. So, these are basically a description of composite materials in terms of effective medium approximations. Okay? And this allows, this is basically a very important tool as I told you, it is a valuable and versatile tool that allows you to investigate, predict and design the electromagnetic response of natural and structured materials. Now, effective medium models, they equip the macroscopic Maxwell's equation with very simple constitutive relations. So, that is where you take care of the light matter interaction. and in that case, you do not need to go into the complexity of uh, looking into all the minute details of light matter interaction at the constituent level. Rather, you can actually deal with the macroscopic Maxwell's equation on a uh, averaged manner for a particular mixture. So, when approaching an electromagnetic problem with effective medium theory, what is very important is to know the limits in which this theory is valid. So, that is basically coming from um, you know that the bounds are called as Wehner bounds which we will see in the next slide. So, if you push the effective medium theory beyond these limits obviously, it will fail. So, you will not get you know uh, correct predictions rather you may get wrong predictions. And effective medium theory usually depend on the electric and magnetic properties of the constituent materials, the volume fraction of the each constituent and in some case the geometry of the structure at the constituent level also gets into this particular theory. 
we will look into the different theories and different cases where each of these theories can be used. So, the fundamental limitation of this model always you have to remember that every theory is valid for a certain uh, range, but then it also fails beyond certain uh, limit and also there are some limitation or approximation or you can say simplification that has been considered while uh, deriving these theories. So, first thing is that when you are looking for any approach for homogenizing the structured materials, it is always the underlying assumption that the wavelength of the light is much larger than the characteristic scale of the inhomogeneity. So, in other words you can say all those inhomogeneity is basically much much smaller than the wavelength of light or they are simply sub wavelength in nature. Now, depending on the size, permittivity and permeability of the constituents as well as the index of the hosting medium or the background medium, the limitations of the model can be more strict or less strict. Okay? So, here is one example. So, here you see you have a host medium with permittivity epsilon h and then there is it has got some inclusions which are basically nanoparticles. Now, these are two different types of nanoparticles being mixed here. So, one is type 1 nanoparticles which is given as epsilon 1 np is the permittivity of that nanoparticle and the other type is this one that has got a permittivity of epsilon 2 np. Okay? And then these are all homogeneously distributed or you can say they are randomly distributed does not matter the distribution does not matter here. Okay. They are into this host medium and effective medium theory will be able to give you epsilon effective of this composite system which has got a background medium and two different type of constituent materials, but you will be able to get a effective permittivity using the effective medium theory. Okay. So, we will actually look into this aspect in today's lecture. So, as I mentioned for mixtures there exist limits on the range of possible effective permittivity values. So, when you mix two or three different materials you cannot um, get very abrupt or out of the world uh, permittivity values. No, that is not possible. So, you can actually get some uh, effective values which are limited by some upper bounds and lower bounds. So, those bounds are known as Wehner bounds. Okay? So, there are some formula that helps you to find out what is that minimum permittivity and maximum permittivity. So, if you consider a two component system, it means you have one material and the other material. So, one material is filling a fraction of f in the, in the volume. So, the fraction for the other material is obviously 1 minus f. And this is how you find out this formula tells you how do you find out the minimum limit. Similarly, you can also find out what could be the maximum permittivity for this kind of a system. So, if you think of a multi component system, there also you can find out what is uh, the minimum permittivity. So, here instead of f, you will have fm. So, this is the fraction of the volume occupied by that material of m index. So, now all the fractions if there is a 2, 3 or 4 different materials. So, it will be like f 1, f 2, f 3 and f 4 should add up to 1. In this case it is only 2 variables. So, here f 1 plus f 2 equals 1. Okay? So, you will get this formula basically. So, if you take uh, 1 as f the other is basically 1 minus f and that you have seen here. So, this is the formula that tells you about the minimum permittivity and maximum permittivity for the case of a multi component system. Okay? And now, when you plot this, if you take a two component system and you take uh, epsilon r 1 equals 200 and epsilon r 2 equals 2.5. Okay? So, if you take this, uh, so it is basically like um, 2.5 is basically the background medium and then you have uh, dielectric nanoparticle, very high dielectric nanoparticle, uh, high permittivity dielectric nanoparticle inclusions. Okay? In that case, you can see this is how you will, your epsilon max will be. 
and this is how the minimum will be okay so the minimum value can go to you know the it's here so you can actually when you when you keep on increasing the volume fraction okay that is when you are making f is close to 1 you can go up to 200 and uh, when you make f equals 0 that is that dielectric inclusions in the host permittivity is negligible in that case the effective permittivity is nothing but same as the host permittivity which is epsilon r2 that is 2.5 clear so with that these are the bounds within which the effective permittivity will be so these all these values are possible depending on what fraction you choose okay that is how you can always go and find this this region is allowed okay so that is how mixing can give you that many possibilities now let us look into one of the most popular effective medium theories which is called maxwell garnet theory okay so this is the classical approach for homogenizing uh, media which has got small inclusions dispersed in a continuous medium or matrix so one particular um, schematic will make it clear so it is like this the basic structure is a two phase medium with separated grains of the guest material so here you see the guest material is this one which is got a permittivity of epsilon i the host medium has got a permittivity of epsilon h okay and you are supposed to find out the effective permittivity of this particular system okay uh, you using some theory and this is where maxwell garnet theory will come into the picture so we restrict the analysis to the analysis to the case of non magnetic and isotropic materials so there are some assumptions so initially i mentioned about the assumptions so here the assumptions are that that the materials we considered are non magnetic and isotropic so how do you start with that first thing if those inclusions the small islands are sub wavelength in nature so you can easily adapt quasi static approximation that you have already understood in previous lectures so in that case the if you see that the inclusions are positive permittivity uh, inclusions okay then the following rule of thumb is considered to be conservative so you can actually go with this rule that the particle size should not exceed one tenth of the effective wavelength so it should be less than lambda by 10 okay and lambda is what that is at at this particular wavelength you are measuring the effective medium permittivity and if you get a metallic or uh, negative permittivity inclusions the limit of the validity is much more stricter okay and this is the reason here is that because this negative permittivity materials as we have discussed before they can show localized surface plus bond resonance so in this case they need to be you need to be very very careful about um, this particular particle size limit okay so let us see how do we go about that so in case you do not have this information about the shape of the inclusion okay so the shape can be any arbitrary shape so the natural approach would be to assume each of those as very tiny spheres okay and uh, that is how you can actually see how maxwell garnet homogenization work so you can consider each of these inclusions at as spheres of different different size and if the material is excited by an uh, external electric field so in quasi static approximation we can understand that in this case you know the field on each of these uh, tiny spheres that we have uh, considered the field will be static and that is why it is called quasi static approximation right and we are considering the external field to be ee okay that is the notation we are using here ee okay so first we will so let us see into the derivation of this uh, formula how maxwell garnet theory helps helps us in getting the epsilon effective okay so first of all we have to focus on the response of each isolated sphere 
to this excitation. So, there is an electric field and to this how these isolated spheres are responding. Okay. Now, we have seen that when the sphere is very small, it just acts as a point source with an electric dipole moment proportional to the applied field and that will be at the center of the particle. So, you can write that um, response of an isolated sphere where the host medium is epsilon h. So, that isolated sphere can be written as pH equals epsilon naught epsilon h alpha e. Okay. Now, what is epsilon naught? That is the vacuum permittivity okay. and alpha is basically the static electric polarizability of the spheres that you have considered. So, this you remember from the quasi static uh, formula that alpha is basically 3 V times epsilon i that is the material of that uh, sphere minus epsilon h over epsilon i plus 2 epsilon h okay. and V, what is V? V is the volume of that sphere. Okay. So, now once we have this uh, formula, we can always write what is the electric field inside the sphere and that will be 3 h over epsilon i plus epsilon i plus 2 epsilon h times epsilon e and we consider this field to be uniform and parallel to the external electric field E. e okay? So, with these two things, we have also seen that the polarizability because the sphere is very tiny, the polarizability of the sphere is considered to be isotropic uh, since both permittivity and the shape are assumed to be isotropic. So, polarizability is also isotropic. So, so, what comes as the next? The next step would be to create an effective model of the distribution of the nanospheres. So, that allows you to give you this kind of a homogenization picture. Now, the spheres are now reduced to point dipoles. You can consider them as electric point dipoles and the field they are radiated, okay, each dipole is radiated will influence the all other dipoles in that particular medium. So, in such a case, you need to get an information about how many such dipoles are there in unit volume. So, let us assume that there are n such dipoles in that unit volume. So, now you can define the effective permittivity based on the average or macroscopic constitution relationship that would link your displacement field the average displacement field to the average electric field. Normally, what happens? D equals epsilon E. So, that is where the epsilon comes into the picture. So, in this case, the D displacement field is also the average field, the electric field is also the average field. So, epsilon will be now the effective permittivity of that medium. right? So, the average operator integrates over sufficiently large volumes to provide an accurate description of the average fields of the original medium and so you can write this particular expression. So, you can write average d is nothing but epsilon naught epsilon mg. So, epsilon mg is nothing but the Maxwell Garnet effective permittivity of this particular system and then multiplied by the average electric field. And you can also see that this we have, we have understood that this dielectric uh, displacement field has got actually two, two parts. One is the average response of the host medium. So, this is from the host medium alone and plus there is some average response of the point dipoles which are basically the inclusions. right? So, if you look into the point dipoles, this point dipoles, uh, the average polarization is basically n times small p and here remember that this small p is not same as that isolated spheres uh, polarization or, or dipole moment. Okay. Here, this small p is basically uh, the dipole moment that is uh, calculated in the presence of all other dipoles in that system. Okay. So, the evaluation of this small p is classically performed by evaluating the local electric field which is denoted by E L and this is the local electric field which is felt or experienced by each point dipole in the presence of all other dipoles. Okay. So, the field, this field, this local electric field is basically the average field augmented by a contribution due to the average polarization that surrounds each dipole and this is also known as the Lorentz field. Okay? Now, how do you find out this E L? To find out E L acting on a sing, uh, single dipole, 
a simple model of the mixture can be adopted where a fictitious spherical boundary like this is uh, can separate okay this dipole from the background media now this background media has got a average polarization of p okay and there is a average electric field of e but this uh, dipole is in a kind of uh, spherical boundary which is separated from this uh, macroscopic background so with that you can write out write down elect local electric field el will be nothing but the average electric field plus the polarization divided by 3 epsilon naught epsilon h and from that you can also write down what is the dipole moment small p that is given by this expression now in this expression when you put your uh, you know you can from this you can retrieve the maxwell gardner permittivity in terms of polarizability alpha and number density n so you can write epsilon mg is nothing but the host permittivity 1 plus n alpha over 1 minus n alpha by 3 so i'm not showing the overall calculation here but this can be obtained from this uh, formula and in the case of uh, very diluted media you can consider so n is very diluted media means n is very small capital n is very small so you can actually consider these as close to 1 so in that case the effective permittivity will be simply epsilon h 1 plus alpha n so this is how you can find out the effective permittivity and the same expression can be easily obtained when you put that your local electric field is only this one so the contributions from the neighboring dipoles are also negligible so this kind of approximation is fully justified in the case of a diluted mixture where the interactions between the dipoles is weak that means when the spheres that you have seen are far away from each other that they do not interact with each other in that case also in that case this particular approximation will be valid and using this formula you should be able to find out the effective permittivity very easily okay now you have seen this particular case that at na by 3 so from this you can find out this one and then you can also write that um, na by 3 equals epsilon mg minus epsilon h over epsilon mg plus 2 epsilon h okay that is coming from this equation okay and this this equation is also known as the clausius musotti formula or it is also called as maxwell's formula or lorentz lorentz formula okay now in this one if you put alpha from the quasi static theory that is alpha equals 3v epsilon i minus epsilon h over epsilon i plus 2 epsilon h okay you will be able to get this kind of a formula which is also known as Rayleigh formula okay so in this what is epsilon mg that is basically the effective permittivity of this medium and what is f small f f is basically nv that is the volume fraction of the inclusions and in this case it is sphere so from that you can find out you know what is the effective permittivity that is epsilon mg in terms of epsilon i epsilon h and f so these are the three things you got to know you should know the permittivity of the host medium permittivity of the inclusions and the filling fraction of this material in this entire volume so you add up all these volumes okay and divide by the total volume that is your filling fraction fine so this simple formula represents a classical approach to homogenization of the composite media and it is widely used in many many applications remember here we have to make sure that the nanoparticles are far away from each other so that they are not interacting okay so this is the case now it is also important to notice that the only necessary parameter for retrieving the maxwell's garnet permittivity are basically three things okay as i mentioned the volume fraction and the two permittivities and this formula does not require uh, 
the spheres to be of the same size and they should be located at a specific location. So, all these um, requirements are not there. So, you do not want your uh, spheres particularly to form an array or something, nothing like that. So, the only requirement here is that the wavelength in the medium must be much larger than the size of the inclusion so that the quasi static approximation remains valid. So, Maxwell Garnet theory also predicts the following. So, if you put f equals 0, you get effective permittivity to be same as the host one and if you put f equals 1, you will get the effective permittivity to be same as the inclusions one. Okay? That is pretty simple. So, that, that tells you about the Maxwell's Garnet theory. The next uh, important and popular theory is Bergman's theory. So, we have seen that Maxwell Garnet formula represents a valid homogenization model for mixtures with a well defined host medium and inclusions right and they result more accurately for small values of inclusion volume factor f so smaller the f is you will get more and more accurate result now there could be aggregate mixtures which has got random distribution of two or more constitutive uh, materials and in those case the effective medium theories should be based on some statistical formulation right and these are the cases where you know you have continuous boundaries and any of this material can be of any permittivity and they may have a different fill factor right so these are the cases where you actually use bragman's theory so, here also what you will do, you will try to find a uh, medium. So, you will try to find what is epsilon br that is the effective medium. So, you have the host medium and the inclusion medium. They are, they are basically uh, capturing different regions. So, you will see that how do we handle this particular class of inhomogeneous mixture through Bragman's theory. So, let us consider two phase microstructure of the type that is shown in this figure where the constituent material of permittivity epsilon i has filled a volume factor f and in that case the other permittivity f material epsilon h will have a volume fill factor of 1 minus f. Okay? So, this mixture will be now modeled as a continuum continuous medium hosting a distribution of small and large spherical inclusions of the two different dielectric permittivities. So, one is h epsilon h another one is epsilon i okay? and the background one or the overall one is basically epsilon br not the background one the overall or the effective one. So, the probabilities of uh, finding spheres of permittivity epsilon i will be f and for finding permittivity uh, spheres with permittivity epsilon h the probability is 1 minus f. Okay? So, this basically corresponds to their volume fill uh, factors in the original mixture. Now, we can assume that the host medium uh, for this Bragman mixture has unknown effective permittivity. So, what is that? That effective permittivity we write as epsilon br. Okay? So, how this will be related? So, you can write down the basic form of the Bragman theory is f times epsilon i minus epsilon br over epsilon i plus 2 epsilon br okay, plus 1 minus f times this. So, if you see can you find out what are these basically? These are basically the contributions coming from uh, spheres of uh, permittivity epsilon i in a effective background medium of this one plus the volume fraction of the other other type of spheres which has got permittivity of epsilon h in a background of epsilon br. So, this is how you add up these two contributions okay? and that is basically the basic form of the Bragman's theory. Now, if you have more inclusions not only two say if, if you have a multi phase aggregate in that case it will be simply summation small m equals 1 to capital M f m epsilon m minus epsilon br over epsilon m plus 2 epsilon br equals 0. So, what is f m? f m is the uh, filling fact 
factor or volume fill fraction of the mth constituent of the mixture and there are total m number of capital M number of phases right. So, the limitation of the Maxwell Garnet theory that the particles um, with very small depolarization factors. Now, what, what do you mean by depolarization factor? A low depolarization factor means it actually polarizes ok. So, you are you may think of you know elongated shapes like uh, ellipsoids and all these things and this kind of shapes they may result in strong particle particle interaction and as I mentioned previously that in Maxwell Garnet you do not actually um, like those kind of contributions or interactions to come into play. So, in this situation um, which is similar to the situation of a mixture of large inclusions fill factor, the Bragman's prediction can be adopted. Okay. So, if the grain boundary is very specific and the density is less, you go for Maxwell Garnet. But if you see that you know the large inclusions are there and the in this kind of situation, you can go for Bragman's theory. Another situation in which Bragman theory looks more realistic will be for the mixtures with large difference of in the permittivities of the constituents. Something like if you have metal dielectric mixture okay, where uh, percolation phenomena above a threshold of the metallic phase takes place. So, in those cases you know you should go for Bragman theory. Now, if you do not know what this particular uh, phenomena is. This is basically a threshold uh, that is the critical metal filling factor above which there is a formation of uh, kind of long connectivity between the metal grains and the optical response of the uh, mixture will change abruptly. So, there is if, if you are going for a metal dielectric uh, kind of mixture there is a um, threshold beyond which you should not have metal fill fraction. Okay. So, the last kind of uh, the, or the third uh, type of uh, effective medium theory that we will discuss today is the Nicholson Ross Ware method. So, this is a homogenization method based on the inversion of Fresnel formula. Now, if you remember the Fresnel formula, the Fresnel formula allows you to calculate the reflection and transmission coefficient for the interface of two different materials of permittivity we of different permittivity ok. So, in this case you are using the reverse of it. So, you are based on the inversion of uh, Fresnel formula relative to the transmission and reflection coefficient through the slabs of homogeneous medium. Now, this technique was conceived to estimate the complex permittivity and permeability of unknown material from the measured transmission and reflection spectrum of finite thickness sample. So, to do reverse engineering to find out what kind of material could actually uh, provide this kind of uh, permittivity and permeability. So, it was originally proposed in the time domain for pulsed uh, measurement systems and then it, it was adapted for higher resolution systems like frequency, frequency domain systems. Okay. So, the transmission and reflection spectra can be taken from the measurements of experiments or you can actually get them by doing simulations. So, in this case what happens a slab of thickness d of unknown natural or artificial mixture something like this that can be modeled as a slab of homogeneous medium with effective relative permittivity epsilon effective and mu effective that is the effective uh, permeability. So, in this case you are measuring what is the reflectance, what is the transmittance and then you try to find out what is the effective permittivity and permeability that gives that kind of a transmission and reflection coefficient. Okay. So, it is supposed that the thickness of the homogeneous slab is equal to d. So, what you do the complex reflection and transmission coefficients. So, note that in uh, Fresnel theory we used to use small r and small t for coefficients. So, here uh, in this particular book uh, they have used capital R, uh, capital R capital T for the coefficients, but you can also change them to small r small t to follow the continuity. Okay. 
So, what they do here, you have small r and small t or capital R capital T here. Okay, I am just talking about the reflection transmission coefficient. Okay. So, it is depending on gamma as well as some n effective. Okay. So, what is this n effective? It is basically the effective refractive index of the slab. So, it comes from square root of mu effective and epsilon effective. Okay. And what is k? k is basically the wave number that is omega by c and the reflection coefficient capital gamma is basically across the first interface between, between the input medium and this semi infinite uh, homogeneous slab that you have made. Okay. So, you can see the gamma is basically taking of this particular form. So, gamma is basically eta effective minus eta naught over eta effective plus eta naught in the case of normal incidence and you can also find out what is eta effective. Okay. So, from that this is basically the impedance and eta naught is the intrinsic impedance of the uh, input output medium. So, if from that you can find calculate what is eta effective. So, I think this there is a typo here this should be n effective not eta and this is eta effective. Okay. So, eta effective is correlated to reflection and transmission coefficient using this formula. Okay. And uh, you can also find out what is the quality uh, q. Okay. And this particular q is given as e to the power minus i k n effective into d. So, q is calculated by t over 1 minus r n eta effective minus eta naught over eta effective plus eta naught. So, these are some formulas that actually tell you how to obtain n effective. Okay. So, I will not go into uh, the details of this formula. The whole idea is to tell you that, that it is also possible to find out the effective permittivity of a kind of system which has got you know uh, meta material kind of uh, design that you have inclusions or you have uh, particles which are in um, arranged in this kind of a format. Okay. So, with this you can obtain epsilon effective and mu effective. So, what are the observations in this case? The first thing is that the choice of sign for the effective impedance and the refractive index does not alter the values of the effective uh, parameters which are obtained via this equation. Okay. And there is some intrinsic ambiguity in the definition of this um, n effective okay, because it is coming from this uh, multi valued complex logarithm and the choice of your uh, branch order m. Anyways, the problem may be solved in very thin slabs in which the effective wavelength is much larger than 2D. So, this kind of method has been extended to characterization of mixtures in the case of oblique plane wave uh, incidence for the study of spatial dispersion effects in metamaterials as I was mentioning. So, this kind of techniques can be used for um, studying the effect of oblique plane wave incidence for spatial distribution uh, effects in metamaterials. So, with that we will stop here and in the next lecture we will discuss single and double negative metamaterials design and thank you. If you have got any queries you can drop an email to my email address.